going to talk about congestive heart failure. Um, here I have it in the middle of the screen. I just want to kind of make a flow chart here to sort of discuss the different aspects of it. Now, congestive heart failure results in decreased cardiac output. Now, you can have decreased cardiac output of the left and the right heart. And, you know, if one side of the heart has, it's all one big system, so if one side of the heart has significant loss of uh, cardiac output, the other side is going to back up to the other side and the other side is going to have decreased uh, cardiac output as well. So right heart failure and left heart failure, um, whether it starts in the right or the left, um, it really doesn't matter. It's in the end because they are linked. So um, you'll end up with just heart failure. Okay, so um, you're with congestive heart failure you have decreased cardiac output now that's going to cause decreased perfusion and the decreased perfusion is going to start a vicious cycle you're going to it's going to stimulate increased sympathetic nervous system activity um, it's going to stimulate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and in order to increase volume <clears throat> and it's going to increase inflammation because of ischemia now interestingly enough all of these things um, work together to create a downward spiral so we end up with worsening congestive heart failure, which causes more sympathetic stimulation, um, activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and more inflammation, which worsens cardiac output and worsens perfusion, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So we have a positive feedback loop, which ends up in a vicious cycle, just making the situation worse and worse. <clears throat> so why does this occur? Well, again, sympathetic increased sympathetic tone is going to cause more inflammation. Um, and it's also going to increase uh, the sympathetic system by being activated. And it's going to be activated because of decreased uh, blood pressure detected at the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies and this is going to stimulate vasoconstriction in order to increase blood pressure but what does vasoconstriction do? Vasoconstriction increases the peripheral vascular resistance and actually decreases flow further and increases blood pressure or increases afterload. So the left ventricle, the weak left ventricle is going to have to pump harder. And again, what does that do? That makes CHF worse and decreases cardiac output. So again, that's all part of the um, <clears throat> positive feedback loop. Then the renin angiotensin system increases blood volume. But the renin angiotensin tensin system also has a significant problem because the angiotensin actually travels to the myocardium and stimulates remodeling of the myocardium in the left ventricle. And it's pathogenic. It makes the left ventricle worse. So particularly in heart failure where you have thickening of the left ventricle, it's going to make that thickening worse. And why is the thickening a bad thing? Well, I'm, going to I'm going to talk about different types of heart failure. One's due to thickening and one's due to weakening of the wall. But thickening makes it worse because it kind of makes the chamber thinner.
so the um, end diastolic volume or total volume of the left ventricle is going to be smaller and it also makes it stiffer so when we try to increase the blood flow to our left ventricle it can't expand to accept that additional volume. So angiotensin is making this situation worse so it's also increasing congestive heart failure as well and, and contrib contributing directly to that downward spiral. Okay, so car congestive heart failure is a progressive disease because of this positive feedback loop and a lot of the medications that we use <coughs> to combat congestive heart failure are actually used to block some of these mechanisms. For instance, we give people <coughs> um, ACE inhibitors or angi angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors that block the production of angiotensin and uh, slow down the remodeling of the left ventricle so we stop contributing to worsening of CHF in that pathway and then we also give pa people beta blockers that decrease um, the sympathetic innervation, uh, the sympathetic um, receptors that are innervating the heart and that um, partially blocks this pathway so that slows down the progression as well. Okay and so that explains part of it and so I wanted to start off by sort of talking about that downward spiral. Now I, I wanted to talk about two different causes of CHF. So one cause, and this is sort of the one that we classically think about, um, is systolic dysfunction. And it is now known as, it, it is now known as left ventricular failure with reduced ejection fraction. Okay, so what happens what causes CHF with systolic dysfunction or decreased EF? Well, that is caused by, um, one of the causes is damage to the myocardium by an MI. And then we have wall motion abnormalities. And the pump just isn't able to pump as effectively, so we end up with a low injection fraction. So if we have a total volume of the left ventricle of being 100, maybe 150 mLs, maybe only 30 percent of that is ejected, so we end up with a stroke volume of only 50 instead of what would normally be maybe 100. <clears throat> so we end up with decreased cardiac output because of a low ejection fraction. So again, this, this is commonly caused post-MI because of wall motion abnormalities. It may also be call, caused by myocarditis. So you may have, this may be post-viral illness or it may be an autoimmune disorder that causes inflammation and damage to the myocardium. But it all results in some kind of weakening of the left ventricular wall which interferes with the adequate functioning and it ends up with a low ejection fraction which means we have a low stroke volume and okay so the other type of left ventricular fa failure um, is called it used to be called diastolic failure and I think this describes it the pathophysiology of it best but it's now known as congestive heart failure with preserved injection fraction. So, you know, oftentimes people will be confused because they'll see an echocardiogram with someone with diastolic failure and they'll see that the EF is 65 percent so they won't believe that they're in significant um, congestive heart failure. But they are. Um, and what's happening here is we have, this is caused almost exclusively by hypertension. So what we have is the left ventricle pumping against uh, very high pressures 
so high afterload and over time the left ventricle responds by thickening the muscle and at first this is a, an effective compensation because the left ventricle is able to pump effectively against those higher pressures but as time continues it starts to shrink the size of the chamber so that we have a lower filling volume. Now remember stroke volume is equal to end diastolic volume or total ventricular volume minus residual volume and with um, ejection with systolic dysfunction we are increasing the residual volume because we're decreasing the EF with diastolic dysfunction we are decreasing the volume of the ventricle or the end diastolic volume so we're affecting the other side of this um, of this equation both have the same end effect of decreasing stroke volume and decreasing cardiac output but they just arrive there from different sides of the equation so what we have here is just smaller volumes in the ventricle so we end up with a volume of maybe 100 cc's and even though we have an ejection fraction of 65 percent we have a stroke volume of 65 instead of what would if with a nice healthy ventricle that has a you know volume of 150 or 180 mls um, we have a much lower volume to start with and a much lower volume to end with so both of them cause decreased cardiac output so what happens when we have decreased cardiac output well one of the effects is we have hypoperfusion of tissues and you can start to have effects all over the body because of that you're going to have decreased urine output and it may contribute to renal dysfunction you're going to have decreased flow to other organs but sort of the bigger acute problem that happens early on is the formation of edema now with left heart failure you end up with pulmonary edema and with right heart failure you end up with systemic edema now remember how I talked about a few minutes ago how these are all part of one closed system so they affect each other so most people with congestive heart failure will have both pulmonary edema and systemic edema now why do patients with heart failure end up with edema well it's simply because we have a backup in the system and so we've got blood that is not flowing out of the ventricle effectively and we still have blood returning from the vein and we end up with a increasing back pressures on the venous systems so if we have left ventricular failure we are going to have increased venous pressures in the pulmonary bed and what does increased venous pressure do well let's review quickly how blood flows in and out of capillaries so here I'm going to draw a little capillary actually let me make it a nice red color and you know, the capillary is lined with endothelial cells and the capillary has both sides have sort of equal amounts of an equal concentration of electrolytes but inside the capillary there is a high concentration of protein now just keep that in your mind um, as fluid flows through the capillary from the arterial end the arterial hydrostatic pressure is 
about 35 millimeters of mercury. And I'm talking about the systemic circulation. So, um, in the systemic circulation, uh, actually the same thing is happening in the pulmonary circulation, but the pressures are just a lot lower. So I just want you to understand the concept. You don't need to know. You don't need to understand the number. The um, fluid pressure out here in, uh, in the interstitial fluid is near zero. It, but it's it's usually got a little bit of pressure to it. Actually, in the lungs, it's probably on the negative side. Um, so we have a net hydrostatic pressure of 33 millimeters of mercury, and that is tending to push fluid out of the capillary. Then um, we have oncotic pressure, and oncotic pressure is due to the high concentration of proteins inside the um, inside the capillary and this tends to draw fluid in through osmosis right so we have osmotic pressure oncotic pressure is just a fancy word for osmotic pressure that is due to proteins and on the arterial side the oncotic pressure is about 24 millimeters of mercury. So you end up with a net filtration on the arterial side of about plus 9. And because it's plus 9, fluid tends to flow out. Now, on the venous side, the pressure is dropping as we move from the arterial side to the venous side. So the hy hydrostatic pressure, here, let me make a little more room here, the hydrostatic pressure now on the venous side has dropped to about 18 millimeters of mercury. And the uh, oncotic pressure is going to stay the same. Concentration of protein in the vein, in the capillary at both ends are going to be about the same. So you're going to end up with a net filtration pressure on the venous side of negative, here what do we come up with, negative 6. And that's going to favor filtration back in, right? So we have fluid going out because the net filtration is out on the arterial end and in on the venous end. Okay, but what happens when we have increased venous pulmonary pressures here is that this number at the venous end increases. So, because the heart is not pumping effectively, the pressure on the venous end may raise close to the pressure, you know, it probably won't be as high as the pressure on the arterial end. But, you know, it may increase to 25. And then we're going to end up with a net uh, filtration pressure of plus 1. So what's going to happen? Well, fluid is not going to flow back in on the venous end. In fact, it may continue to leak out a little bit. So you're going to end up with extra fluid in the tissue, or otherwise known as edema. Now if this happens in the pulmonary uh, system, you're going to end up with pulmonary edema, which is going to cause, you're going to, first you're going to th um, cause uh, the swelling of the alveolar capillary um, membrane and that's going to interfere with oxygen and carbon dioxide um, diffusion and then eventually you're just going to flood the alveoli and you're going to have dead space and that's what causes dyspnea and stretching of the alveoli with fluid can cause a cough and then obviously in the systemic circulation you're going to end up with pedal edema and if it gets bad enough you'll end up with um, edema in the liver and other organs and anasarca. Okay.
Um, so really the symptoms are going to be of, are, are very familiar with those of you who have worked with patients with, um, with congestive heart failure. Um, you're going to end up with dyspnea and orthopnea. Orthopnea is worsening shortness of breath when you lay down. Um, if it's bad enough, you may actually end up with frothy sputum because you're actually, um, you're actually coughing up, um, fluid that has filled the alveoli. You're going to hear crackles on exam. Um, the patient is going to be short of breath and cyanotic. And you may actually also have pleural effusions because the same process is happening in the pleural space. So you're going to end up with fluid in the pleural space around the lungs. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Actually, we'll talk about that and pulmonary edema a little bit more when we get to the pulmonary section in two weeks. Okay, so that is my quick overview of congestive heart failure. Um, please uh, take a moment to give me feedback on the video, and please let me know if you have any questions right in the comments. Um, and if you um, would like to uh, have quick and easy access to my other pathophysiology videos, um, I am working on creating uh, some uh, channels for each system so you'll be able to view all the videos that I have within that system really fast and easy. Um, so click the link below in order to see my channel and I will see you in other videos.